Hey guys, welcome back. This is such an exciting topic. Is it fictional? Is it truth? Labor, delivery, pregnancy, myth or fact submissions. These came from Instagram. You submitted like almost 300 of them. So I'm gonna work through getting all of them addressed. It is not all going to happen today, clearly that video would be very long. Today we're going to be talking about pooping in labor and delivery, getting pregnant with your IUD in place. I forgot what the third one is. Where did it go? If having a medicine-free delivery is worth it and does having an induction increase your risk of a C-section. Before we go any further, I would like to talk about my shirt. It is care of the one and only Philip Franco. He sent it to me, not really, kind of. I purchased it from his merch shop. But if he wants to send me something, especially if it's sarcastic, I will take it. It says, why be informed when you can use your feelings as facts? I don't know, I felt like it was appropriate. Not gonna go into why. Okay, on that note, let's just jump into it. That is what Philip DeFranco says, and he is incredible. I don't know why you're watching me if you don't know who he is, so. Don't leave, don't, don't, don't leave. You kill my watch time, stay, stay. Intro, intro. Okay, I'm trying to talk slower because a few of you nicely told me I talk too fast, which I already know. And I hate to inform you of this, but I'm talking like at minus eight of my typical speed in these videos. And then some of you like totally trolled me about the talking fast thing and I can't help it. I've already slowed down. My brain goes this fast. My speech follows right behind it. And then, yeah, okay. <sighs> trying to bring it down a notch, bringing it down a notch, slower. Trying to bring it back down to earth, guys, I'm trying. All right. Maybe you should listen faster. Maybe you should listen faster. I'm gonna edit that out. That wasn't very nice. I'm trying to be nice. It wouldn't hurt you to listen faster. All right, let's talk about pooping. One of the most repeated myth or fact things that you guys submitted on Instagram was, I'm terrified I will poop in labor. Is this really a thing? Does it usually happen? Please tell me it doesn't happen. I wish I could sit here and tell you it's not a thing or it doesn't happen, but that would be a lie. So, I'm gonna spin this and talk about it more from an angle of why you should not be worried about it. First off, the mechanisms of having a baby are just really similar to the mechanism of having a bowel movement. The muscles you use, the location, all of those things are just really similar. So yes, people sometimes poop while they are pushing and it's fine and actually, your medical team might be happy about it because it just means you are an excellent pusher. I was gonna say that like it was a punchline, but it's not a punchline, it's the truth. That's all I got. So I'm clearly struggling to like effectively normalize this. So I wanna talk about what you could maybe relate it to in your life. If you are a mom or if you know people who are moms, or if you're just a human alive with a heartbeat, you know that moms and dads change diapers. So if you think really long and hard about changing diapers, you might find it to be a little bit gross when you think about it. However, it is so extraordinarily normal and a part of everyday life for any parent or anyone who has ever been a caregiver for a child that it's like a non-event. I don't know how many hundreds of dirty diapers I've changed in my life and it's just not a big deal, right? Because it's normal, that's just what you do. And that's kind of how pooping on labor and delivery is viewed by your medical team. It doesn't always happen, but when it does, it's so totally normal, it's a non-event. We aren't worried about it and you shouldn't be either. It's not like a highlight of our job, but it's also not a negative of our job. Like nobody goes home after delivering a baby or working in a labor and delivery unit and goes, oh my gosh, somebody pooped on L&D today because it's just not like, you just wouldn't ever talk about it. It's just something that sometimes happens. Now, some of you had questions about how do you clean it up? What does this look like? Is it like out there and I, you know, all of this. It's, it's usually just not a big deal. It's like it either goes into the bag that's underneath you or we can covertly clean it up with a towel. It's just not a big deal, guys. I know that is so hard to wrap your head around it if you've never been 
in the situation or you've never seen a baby born, but we're so preoccupied by making sure you're safe, your baby is safe, and that we can have a happy delivery that it's just, it's just, we don't think about it. So I wish I could ease your fears because it seemed like there was a lot of fear around this by telling you that it doesn't happen. I hope that rather than trying to do that and lie to you, I can just normalize that if it does happen, nobody thought twice of it, it's not a big deal. So yeah, try not to worry about it. I know it doesn't help, like I said in the Downton Abbey video, it doesn't help to tell someone not to worry about something. That's not good advice, but I hope it helps to know that it's just a huge neutral non-event to every single person who has ever worked in any capacity around somebody who has delivered a baby. So there you go. Let's just move right along. Now we're going to talk about having a baby naturally is 100% worth it. I think by naturally, this question means without medication or without anesthesia. And it's very hard to answer because I feel like that is extremely individualized. If somebody wants to have a baby without any anesthesia, then I think deciding will that be worth it or not worth it to them totally depends on their motivation for wanting to have a pain medicine free delivery. What I mean by that is if your motivation to have a medication free delivery is I just really want to experience this. It's important to me. I want to see if I can do it. I want to use hypnobirthing or I want to use Bradley method or whatever it is. It's just important to you to do that. Then yeah, you probably would think it was worth it. On the flip side of that, if somebody's motivation for wanting to have a medication or pain medicine free birth is that they are terrified of getting an epidural because they had heard a horror story about something crazy happening that they're just scared of and so they don't want to have the epidural placed or they're just fearful of the anesthesia itself or they have beliefs around the anesthesia that are misguided either they've heard something bad that happened and they need to talk about that or someone in their life is pressuring them not to get an epidural for some reason those would be reasons that having a medication-free delivery may not be worth it to someone. So I think this comes down to motivation and I can't tell you yes or no that that is or is not worth it for you. I can tell you, no, it is not worth it to me. And if you'd like to know why, you can go watch my birth story from PAX because I'm a big wuss. But some of you aren't and that's fine and some of you aren't big wusses and you still want an epidural and that's okay. Me personally, wouldn't be worth it. I am a wuss. I would die. <laughs> Dead. But that doesn't mean that's the right decision for you and it doesn't mean it would not be worth it for you. If I'm talking too fast for you, just click the little settings button down there on the YouTubes and decrease my speed to like 75% or something. That's what I do because when I watch YouTube videos, I can't watch them in normal speed. I watch them in 1.5 or two times speed. It's just where my brain is, guys. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I love this shirt. I just keep looking at it and thinking like, this is just Philip DeFranco. Thank you for supporting science and neutrality, being an excellent news resource for people. I love you, but not in a weird way, a YouTube-y way. I'm married. I think you're married too. I don't love you like that. I love your channel, Philly D. I love your channel. Okay, what am I doing? Why do you watch me talk? I am so weird. Okay, next question. I have show notes, one second. Oh, this is a good one. Okay, if your uterus is heart-shaped, you will get pregnant or you can get pregnant with an IUD in place. So let's back this up and talk about what all of those things mean. Uterus can be shaped many ways and what we call arcuate uterus is known to the general population as a heart-shaped uterus. This isn't really a uterus that actually looks like a heart, but the inside of the uterus on imaging 
is kind of heart-shaped. It's really just got kind of an indention in the top. Arcuate, or heart-shaped uterus, is the most common non-typical uterine shape. About three to four percent of the general population has a uterus that is shaped kind of like a heart. And there are a whole variety of other shapes of uteruses that are much less common but possible, and maybe I'll do a video about uterine anomalies at some point. The question asks about IUDs, so intrauterine devices, which I talked about briefly in my 24-hour vlog, um, on my call day vlog, are contraceptive devices that go inside the uterus. We place them in clinic. There's progesterone one and a copper one. And the reason somebody asked about this is because the inside of the uterus being shaped differently made them wonder if that would increase the failure rate of an IUD. So to continue with this conversation, we need to know what is the failure rate of an IUD. IUDs are very effective forms of birth control. They fail about 0.5% of the time, less than 1% for sure. And that's about the same as the likelihood of getting your tubes tied failing. So your chances of getting pregnant with an IUD in place are about the same as your chances of getting pregnant if you tied your tubes, but IUDs are obviously reversible. The question basically wants to know is a abnormally shaped uterus or a different shaped uterus going to increase the risk that I'm going to get pregnant with an IUD in place? And the generally accepted answer is no, it probably won't. Now, could it increase the risk of the IUD becoming malpositioned, meaning it's too low in the uterus or it's sideways or something to that effect. Maybe. So in order to decide if that matters, we need to know, does that make a difference in pregnancy rates? The answer is in a progesterone IUD, it probably doesn't. In a copper IUD, it might. And the reason is because they work in different ways. Progesterone IUDs absorb progesterone into the uterus. And so if they're a little bit off center or too low, they still work pretty well. A copper IUD works a little bit more by a local reaction, foreign body reaction, and so being in the wrong place may leave some of the uterus exposed to normal conditions and increase the failure rate. The literature says uterine shape does not probably make a big difference in IUD failure rates and certainly not a big enough difference to change your recommendations on whether somebody should use an IUD or not. So, hope that answers the question. Does having a heart-shaped uterus or an arcuate uterus change your risk of pregnancy with an IUD in place? And the answer is probably not. Okay, next one. Is it number four? Are we on number four? What did we talk about? Okay, yeah, I think we're on number four. Number four. I should just stop making numbered lists. Number four, the question is, the submission is, being induced increases my risk of a c-section. I love this submission. Thank you for submitting this. Why am I yelling? Why do I love this submission? Because this is such a commonly held belief, not just amongst you guys, but amongst all of us who work in labor and delivery. We have long thought, particularly in people who have never had a baby, that elective induction would increase the risk of a c-section. And last year, and excellent study came out that said this is actually not true. I think in order to discuss this, we need to talk about what kind of study it is. It is a randomized control trial, and this is an excellent piece of literature. The study said we're going to put people in two groups. These women are going to be in the elective induction of labor group, and these women are going to be in the expectant management group. What expectant management is, is we just wait for you to go into labor on your own. If a medical reason to induce you comes up, we move you to the induction group, but you don't count towards the outcomes in that group because you still weren't our expectant manager. The women who were included in the trial were nulliparous, meaning they had never delivered a baby, relatively healthy, no pregnancy complications. The women who were induced in the 39 week group had not only a lack of an increased risk of C-section, but a decreased risk of C-section. I don't think anybody expected this. Why was that what happened? Why did the women in the expectant management group have an increased risk of C-section? When we've all thought all along that inducing people, especially people who've never had a baby before, increased the risk of C-section. Some of the theories are that as you move through the pregnancy, the baby is less likely to tolerate labor, meaning, as you move through the pregnancy, the baby is more likely to have placental insufficiency or cord problems, which cause heart rate drops or 
things like that in labor and necessitate a C-section based on fetal complications. I don't think we know 100% yet why we see that, but it was significant. For every 28 inductions you do at 39 weeks, you prevent one C-section. This is super important, guys, because we're moving towards trying to reduce our C-section rates, and this could help. Now, I don't think you should be forced to be induced. That is crazy too. This should be an individualized decision. You are not a research paper. This is a discussion. It is not, you have to be induced at 39 weeks. It's just an option. In the group that was not induced at 39 weeks, mom had an increased risk of C-section. Baby had an increased risk of needing respiratory support. And mom had an increased risk of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and preeclampsia. This is important too, because we as a group of OBGYNs, everybody who cares about maternal health in the United States are working so hard to decrease maternal mortality and morbidity. And one of the biggest causes of maternal mortality and morbidity is hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. It's still extremely rare, but it, not the disorder, but like dying from it or having severe complications from it are still extremely rare, but they are a big part of that group of bad outcomes. How this changes my clinical practice is that I kind of view the time frame between 39 weeks and 41 weeks to be a gray area. So before 39 weeks, we shouldn't induce you unless there's a medical problem. Between 39 and 41 weeks, what this very good randomized control trial on a very large population of women says is that elective induction does not increase your risk of cesarean delivery, does actually decrease it, and may improve both maternal and neonatal outcomes. After 41 weeks, going into labor on your own does not increase the chances that you will have the baby vaginally. It might actually decrease them as compared to elective induction, according to this study. So, all of that to say, this is your decision I never force people to be induced. I think that's crazy, but you should know the information so that you can make a decision that's best for you. There are reasons that someone individually may want to wait. I think it's important that this is out there and that women know about it because the overarching thing that I hear is women thinking that if I'm induced, my C-section risk goes up and it's not true. It is not true according to a very good study. Obviously, as we talked about, you are not research. You are a person and your decision-making should be individualized. That's why we don't do the same thing for everyone. It's just really important to have the facts before you make your decision. Be informed. I am going to link all of this information, as much of it as I can, in the description below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you like Philip DeFranco, you can also give it a thumbs up because I'm wearing his shirt. This shirt's so good, I just love it. Thank you, Philip DeFranco. If you're not subscribed, please hit subscribe. Hello, you are there. Hi friends, goodbye.